I want to thank these wonderful people helping me, Eric, Christian, um, Fred, uh, and all the people, you know, I am not really uh, in technology, I am more conductor, uh, but I'm very happy to, to, to talk to you and to tell you about choral composition in Venezuela in the 20th and 21st century. Actually, um, I think we spoke a lot uh, today about what we are doing from an educational point of view. And um, I think that in Venezuela in particular, we were very lucky to have um, um, a short um, history of colonial choral music that Christian will speak about tomorrow. Uh, but some of these composers who were composing during the 18th century uh, were very solid composers who got influence from um, European composers, particularly from uh, Pergolesi. That was, he had a, I don't know why, we got a huge collection of Pergolesi music, uh, Thomas Luis de Victoria and Palestrina in the Caracas Cathedral. So I think that was the greatest school our composers really could get. And after the 19th century, we come into the 20th century, and there is one figure uh, that I will uh, present uh, first here, um, um, who created the Escuela de, uh, Escuela de Santa Capilla. Uh, this was a music school and that was founded by uh, this man, whose name is Vicente Emilio Soho. Soho was um, almost an autodidacta, autodidacta, how do you say that? Self-taught. Self-taught uh, person. Very, uh, the mind, very intelligent mind. He, he came from a very humble background, but he loved to read uh, um, Hispano, Latin American poetry. And he was very interested in all this collection of music that was in the Caracas Cathedral. So he founded, in 1929, the first symphony orchestra in the 20th century in Venezuela. He founded the first um, mixed choir, Orfeón Lamas, and he created also a school of composition. So he put all this together, and he surrounded himself with all these wonderful people who are in the list. Juan Bautista Plaza, Antonio Esteves, Ángel Sauce, Emencio Castellanos, Inocente Carreño, Antonio Lauro, José Antonio Garcaño, and Gonzalo Castellanos. You know, it's one generation, really. Uh, he was the oldest of the generation, but he was not old enough to, to teach, for instance, Juan Bautista Plaza, or to teach even Antonio Esteves. However, he was such a, a wonderful mind that he um, got all these people around him and they created a school of composition. And what were they writing? They were writing music especially for the new formed choir, for the Orfeon Lamas. Their main interest was not to write major operas or symphonies or string quartets. They were writing for the voice, for the choir, and they were investigating in the music of the, their time in other countries. So if you go to a um, small piece that you have in your folder, uh, it's called Alananita from uh, Manuel Oltra in Spain. Perhaps you can play, you can play for me the uh, solo part. But if I have a solo, a soloist who wants to sing the solo part, you can do that. It's very, it's very simple um, melody. Let's just sing through, so that you have a, a la, you, ha, you will have three pieces for me. One is a la nanita. The other one is Pregúntale a ese mar. This is in the folder. And another one which is called now Maish. Okay, let's 
from a, a Spanish composer, Manuel Oltra, from the same generation of this composer. Because they knew, they, knew their, they knew each other, they knew the work that they were doing. You know, people were going back and forth. And the way the Spanish composers of the beginning of the century were writing vocal music influenced very much the Venezuelan composers. One of the main um, aspects of, the, of this school of composition was the uh, treatment of words. And Soho was a very uh, conscious uh, teacher and composer in uh, creating the right accentuation of the words within the bar line. For him, it was very important that the poem was really sung in the right way within the bar line. So he did many exercises with his pupils all the time of decomposing the poem you know, into the syllabic structure, into the phrase structure. And after that methodology was really understood by the composers, then he started creating, <coughs> he allowed to create simple melodies with some Spanish uh, harmonies or simple tunes, and then to develop more into the contrapuntal style. This is why I think in that school of composers, we have a wonderful amount of madrigals and choral songs that are really a, a great treasure of music for uh, not only for Venezuelan, but for Latin American um, and for the, for the world. Um, they were using also many um, um, in very interesting poets. They were choosing poets from uh, Latin America, but they were also choosing poets from Spain. And they were um, writing in a very atmospheric way. Poems that had metaphoric uh, images, poems that were more nationalistic, poems that were more dramatic, you know, all kind of words. So um, I would like you to listen from, uh, um, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm, I don't have a, such a good recording from Soho now, but I would like to listen uh, from Antonio Lauro, who uh, was himself a wonderful guitarist, uh, one of his um, uh, most important um, madrigals is called Allá va un encobija. <laughs> Thank you. 
declamation of the poem and the way we understand it as conductors and singers is that we have to declaim, we have to say the poem the way the composer uh, wrote it. Um, Lauro is one of the, in this group of composers, is one of the, the composers who was writing more, let's say, in a um, sort of neoclassical way, uh, a very clear harmony on counterpoint, and I would like to sing with you, that we sing together, Pregunta le a ese mar from Innocente Carreño. And this is a, a poem by Juan Veroes, um, who is um, a Venezuelan um, poet. Um, Innocente Carreño is from all this generation uh, one of the few leading composers till today. Uh, he's in his 90s. Uh, and um, the, you see, the, the, the sense of the poem is uh, very beautiful. It says, Pregúntale a ese mar donde solía llorar mi corazón, as the sea where my heart cried. Si por su arena con dulce silbo de voz sirena cruzó la Virgen que me diera un día, Contar los granos de la arena mía. So you have there the translation. So this kind of rhyme, of, of rhythm of the poem, you have in the music. Can, do, can we just try to sing um, with, if you want, la la la. I, I don't want you to sing with words. But just let's see the, a little bit the melodies. Anna.
written, it was immediately performed. The Orfeon Lamas was not singing other music, but the music of their composers. And I think this is something really very interesting in our singing. So Soho has um, a, a, a very wide catalog. I, don't, I didn't put everything here. I just put some of them. Uh, but also they were writing a lot of sacred music. Because in those days, in particularly in Caracas, um, the cathedral and the main churches that are in the center of the city did have um, activity as uh, kapellmeisters. They had some musicians who were conducting choirs and creating new music for the, for the church in Latin. So that's why they wrote so many um, also sacred pieces. Uh, along with Soho, Juan Bautista Plaza was one of the other great masters. He studied in Rome, and uh, he, um, he was really a very well-trained man in everything that related to liturgy, to Gregorian chant, to um, um, sacred music, but was also a wonderful musicologist. And it was Juan Bautista Plaza who uh, discovered in the, uh, in, uh, in the archives, all the music from the school of composers that were working in Venezuela in the 18th century. And he made the new catalog, and he, um, he um, really created the archive of our history, of what we have. Antonio Esteves, he is a very interesting composer. He came from a uh, a different background. Both Soho and Plaza were more from uh, Caracas, from the city. Antonio Esteves came from the plains, from the Llanos, uh, from the flat land. And the people in the Llanos, uh, in Venezuela and Colombia, we share, we are like one country. Uh, we inherited from the um, Spanish uh, conquerors and from Andalusia tradition, we inherited a style of singing and a style of making music that became, um, um, that stayed there as in a pocket. Um, the music of the Llanos is mainly a music sung by a high voices of men, tenors. Um, in this music, um, usually tenors make a sort of a duel of singing between two of them, you know, one sings, the other answers. And the accompaniment of this kind of song is uh, made by a small ensemble of three instruments. Cuatro, which is a small guitar with four strings that we inherited from the Spanish guitarrilla. They brought that small guitar to us and it stayed like that. You know, it didn't change. Um, diatonic harp. Why diatonic harp? We didn't have any Celtics or anybody coming, but the diatonic harp, we assume it's that they heard harpsichords in the hacienda, and the harpsichords were broken, and then they built something that sounded like a harpsichord, and it's this sort of diatonic harp, and maracas, but not the, not the salsa maracas that we were looking at, the small maracas that we inherited from the Indians. And this combination 
It's a very rich combination that uh, created a rhythm typical for us called Joropo. Esteves wrote a lot of music, uh, newly composed, but with this national imprint in his music. One of those songs that perhaps you have heard um, is Mata de l'anima sola. Uh, the poet um, talks about uh, the tree, a tree of the lonely soul in the middle of the plain. What does it mean? In these uh, places, people believe in ghosts. Uh, people believe in stories of death and, you know, of all kind of, um, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, a ghostly situation. I don't know how to say that. And here, um, the poet says, Mata del anima sola, boquerón de banco largo, Ya podrás decir ahora, aquí durmió Canta Claro. So the poet says, Tree of the Lonely say, Soul, you will be able to say that by your feet or by your uh, somber, Canta Claro, the man who sings in the best possible high voice, has slept here. Okay? And Esto Antonio Esteves is also very famous with a wonderful. Uh, orchestral symphonic piece called Cantata Criolla, which is a choral symphony. It's a big piece on the same style, and the main um, story of the Cantata Criolla is a singing duel between two voices, a tenor and a bass. The tenor is Florentino, the hero of the Janus of the plain, and the bass is the devil who follows Florentino during the plains on a night of rain. Finally, they meet each other and they engage in a real counterpoint, very heavy, rhythmically. And this is a very good piece, but I, I don't have it, uh, I don't have the time to do it today, but Mata de Anima Sola is like a preamble for uh, this piece. So let's hear Mata de Anima Sola, and this will be really our nationalistic uh, train of composition in the beginning of the century. that we have is Angel Sauce. Um, he was uh, uh, writing very important choral symphonic music and also uh, very interesting uh, uh, choral uh, arrangements of popular music. Inocente Carreño, I already told you about him, uh, Antonio Lauro, we already uh, heard. Evencio Castellanos, he was a wonderful uh, organist and pianist himself. He wrote a lot of sacred music, but also very beautiful madrigals. And Gonzalo Castellanos, who was really the, I would say, the first important uh, orchestral conductor 
in Venezuela, who studied with Sergio Cherubidake. And from Gonzalo Castellanos, we learned really in Venezuela more about the technique of conducting orchestras and choirs. In the second, uh, also Jose Antonio Calcaño, he was a, also a very important musicologist and composer. In the second generation, younger generation, we have Modesta Bor. She's a very interesting composer. She um, studied in Venezuela, but she went to study in Russia in the 1960s, and she was a pupil of Kashaturian. And when she came back, she had a wonderful training also as a, um, as a composer. And um, from her, we, we, have, we inherited a lot of uh, very beautiful music and uh, music that um, uh, relates to what we were saying uh, of the madrigal songs, but with more expanded harmonies. Uh, but also she did more uh, uh, modern compositions already in cluster kind of compositions and expanded tonality in Mancha Sonoras and Prismas Sonoras. Alberto Grau, I would say, perhaps, is one of the most important composers of uh, choral music in our um, time. And I would like to stop a little bit here, because uh, Alberto was a pupil of Soho, but was also a pupil of Gonzalo Castellanos and also of Chelibidake. So he combined to be a very good choral conductor with uh, a very interesting composer. He has written music for mixed choirs, female choirs, and children choirs. But the thing about Alberto's music is that he always wrote music for a specific purpose. His music was not uh, to be written because he liked only he liked a poetry or he liked a text. He was writing for his choirs to challenge his choirs or to challenge his uh, pupils. And this is why in his music we find different stages of uh, difficulties. I would say that today one of the most important aspects of Alberto Grau's music is the work he has done for the children to develop a repertoire that is um, uh, indigenous to our children choruses. He created a repertoire for our children where he chose beautiful Spanish poetry, specially written for the children in Spanish, good language, uh, good images and metaphors, uh, good vocabulary for them to learn, good vocabulary. But also he incorporated in all his music uh, body movement and eurythmics. For him, eurythmics are part of uh, life in the sense that music cannot be understood only from here to here, <coughs> but music has to be understood as a whole. So we start teaching children since they are very young to not, is not dance, but is to feel the rhythm in the body and to have that uh, concept uh, in, uh, integrated into the music. This is nothing new. Dal Cross was doing that already at the end of the, at the beginning of the 20th century. So we can see uh, um, I, I want to show you a score and play a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah, this is written for a uh, panel de Ricamiel. This is written for a three part choir. Of course, this is already for us, this will be a choir about nine years, ten years old. Um, and he writes in a way that he here is all the movement that they have to do is already incorporated into the, into the uh, score. So these are feet, so they will have to do one, ting-tang, 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 creating uh, this uh, um, rhythmic structure in the body together with what the piano is doing. <laughs>
Um, I also want to show to you a little bit of another composition by Alberto Grau, written for a youth choir, mixed choir, uh, Binamma. And this is uh, using um, um, a language that comes from uh, um, um, an idea of um, onomatopoeic sound. Um, this composition was done for uh, when in Venezuela we had uh, terrible floods, uh, rain, mudslides, and in homage to those who lost their lives and houses and everything, Alberto created this composition. And he starts with a simple Catalan song. He is from Catalonia. And this Catalan song says, Sol sulet vina maveura, vina maveura. And from this vina maveura, he took this word, vina ma. And this is a sort of hymn to the sun using many elements that come also from the Indian uh, traditions in Brazil, like the Tres Cantos Nativos that we were doing last night in a little way. So uh, Pinama is a composition that incorporates a lot of dissonances, um, new techniques of composition, and also movement for the choir. Let's hear a little bit of Pinama. <laughs> sing through it, but you have it. Uh, this Now Maish uh, is also a very new composition by Alberto. And I just want to explain a little bit uh, the way he's, uh, he's writing. He, he, he wants to create, for instance, um, a, a text of, uh, uh, of rain, of a uh, texture of rain. So he creates that with this onomato onomatopoeic sounds at the beginning. And um, you see this um, in the notation, uh, in the sopranos, and the notation explains what you have to do, as uh, you see in other parts, in other scores. And here you will have a really a, a song for a, a solo soprano and solo baritone with accompaniment of choir in the rhythm of bossa nova, for instance, but with very rich harmonies. So this is newly composed, and this piece really, uh, I think, has been um, premiered uh, only in one concert, but not, it's coming out of the oven, and I wanted to bring it to you for you to, uh, I mean, for you to see and to, uh, um, well, I mean, to, to get interested in, in this music of Alberto. Since I have to be very fast, I want to go on. Um, to other composers, and um, from that generation also, Francisco Rodrigo is a very important composer of uh, sacred music. Uh, Federico Ruiz is uh, today also one of the most important composers of that uh, generation, not only for choral music, but also for um, music, for music that uh, relates to choir. He has a different way to approach nationalism and uh, ideas from folk traditions. He writes a prelude and a few based on a popular theme. Uh, it's called El Santiguao. El Santiguao is somebody that you, that you bless. 
and the prelude is uh, uh, written uh, in an expanded uh, uh, um, um, slow form, and the fugue is in the fifth eight rhythm of our merengue. <laughs> Also Miguel Astor, um, who has uh, uh, devoted very much of his time to write for um, um, sacred music. But I think since I have only five minutes left, um, I want to come to another uh, pocket of information of our um, 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 music. I am presenting other composers, Alfredo Rugeles, uh, Josefina Benedetti, Beatriz Bilbao, but um, the composers that I'm presenting here now, um, and Christian too, uh, are composers who, uh, <laughs> yes, who have devoted a lot of their uh, energy and time to write wonderful choral arrangements for popular music. I mean, popular music it, it still is part of, uh, still no, is a very important part of the uh, choral repertoire of our choirs. And all of these composers really are doing um, very beautiful arrangements uh, for choirs, for children, for um, mixed choirs, and we always incorporate um, uh, instruments. So I want, I want to play from Christian, uh, an arrangement he did for the children choir. It's, uh, it's a golpe, it's called the Two Sparrow Hawks. Uh -huh. Thank you. 
examples of this, but uh, perhaps um, if I want to say something to close is that uh, in our choral music today uh, there are many different trends, ways of writing, approaching choral music, uh, and popular music is part of uh, our daily, um, uh, daily life. We don't have a, like a line between art music and folk music. However, I have to say that choral arrangements have really uh, become more and more elaborated and more and more complex as the choirs also develop themselves. And talking with Joan, we were saying, uh, why composers write music that is more elaborated, more complex, uh, more challenging? Because there are choirs that can do it and because there are conductors who want to conduct it, and because there are commissions, you know, and people who want to uh, really go further. And I would, I would like to uh, say that in Venezuela, uh, we are very lucky to be on that situation. I mean, to have had a wonderful start in the 20th century with this uh, school of composition that have carried throughout the century, and also a very good school of conducting, of choral conducting, of orchestral conducting, that has allowed musicians to develop in a way that if you as a leader are well trained and have ideas of how to choose repertoire and what to go for for your ensembles, you will then uh, also challenge composers to write for these ensembles. Thank you very much and thank you for the help of your